Great, folks. Um, the last session, hopefully, you know, like everyone is uh, as energetic as you were in the first session. So uh, this is more about the strategic part, right? So I'm going to walk through the enterprise transformation through sustainable modernization, and I will also be diving deep into hybrid cloud. Uh, a bit about me, I'm Vinod. I'm a senior specialist SA with migrations and modernizations team. I deal with mid-enterprise and enterprise customers. Uh, I help them frame the transformation journey. I work hand in hand with them. Uh, and I would like to share that knowledge and experience to you so that it helps with your journey. Uh, with that, I'm going to start with the why on the modernization drivers, why we really have to do it, and uh, what are the factors that is going to influence. Um, what are the different layers whenever we think about transformation? And finally, what is the kind of enterprise transformation model, which uh, you are either as a customer or if you're a partner, your end customer should go through so that you are able to be successful uh, in the overall journey. So whenever we talk about the uh, transformation drivers for modern business, the first and foremost is the business outcomes. You got to understand what is the end business outcome which your customer is trying to achieve, and you got to drive down uh, the experience and the business model associated with that. If we think about a decade ago, you don't have any social media platform that acted as a um, um, full-time uh, business platform. But now, social media platform is one of the ways by which business are reaching out to their end customers. So the experience and the business model has definitely changed, and you got to cater for the needs of the latest gen users. And the foundation of all these business drivers are three things. One, security. We discussed in detail, we had sessions you know, like that covered about uh, security, the flexible infrastructure. And another aspect that you will have to think about is also about retaining and attracting talents. You need to have fresh thinking. You need to have a fresh flow of knowledge. And you need to have you know, mentorship from your experience team to go ahead and get your um, business transformed to the next level so that you would be able to achieve the top level tiers that are specified over here. And thinking about transformation, it is a journey. Towards the left, you could see that it is completely infrastructure based. Let's say if you are an IT services based company, then probably you will be starting from your left where you'll be thinking about sustainability, the availability, security, performance, and the cost aspects of it. And towards the extreme right is your business outcomes, where the thought process is that you should be able to maximize your business results. You are able to go ahead and set up your business in a new geography. You are able to release new product pipelines. You are able to go ahead and achieve the revenue that is required for your business to keep that chain going on. And in the middle is the architecture. This is going to be the engine that connects your IT and your business part of it. And if you see and, uh, you know, like I think on a high level on how architecture is going to influence your overall transformation, the agility part and the innovation part, which we saw with the earlier sessions, or even if you have to think about, you know, like different ways of hosting your application, it purely depends on how fast you are able to innovate and how easy you are able to adapt to the models that we're going to go through. So with that, let's try to focus on the infrastructure part of the transformation. And I want to give you a bit of um, uh, details on how sustainability is currently driving the core towards the infrastructure transformation. One, there is end customer demand that is going through in terms of achieving that sustainability goals. Government regulations are currently in place, which enforce the organizations and which enforce the enterprise customers to have sustainability goals for them to achieve. Impact investing is other factor which the end customers are trying to achieve by uh, decarbonizing and also utilizing the you know, like water resources and the natural resources in a very responsible way. And from a competitive positioning for you as a company, for you as a business, if you got to go and reach the latest gen um, consumers, then you got to be sustainable in nature. Based on the uh, a trending from September 2020, there is almost four times the level of investment that is going on into the sustainability factors. It is estimated that close to seven billion US dollars have been already invested for the overall sustainability goals by major companies. So as you can see, in order for you to achieve the overall infrastructure um, sustainability goals, you need to partner with someone who have that as part of their bread and butter and also who would be able to help you in terms of managing that heavy lifting. 
And that is where AWS comes into picture, where we are 3.x, six times more efficient than a typical data center that is hosted on a US world, uh, and 88% lower carbon footprint. And this is achieved predominantly by using renewable energies, uh, which we are targeting to be 100%-ish by 2030. But based on the predictions and the projections that has been put through, uh, we might be able to reach that by 2025. In associated with that, all these are strategies. Right? You need to have tactical uh, options in place to support that strategic uh, thinking. To support that strategic layers, tactically, there are processors and compute power that has been uh, newly launched, which provides two to 3.5 times better CPU performance per watt than any other processors. The Graviton 2 processor has been uh, launched to support this initiative. I would also like to walk you through a bit in terms of the journey of uh, how uh, sustainability goals are being tracked and uh, achieved as part of uh, AWS initiatives. AWS understands that this is part of the long journey and it is a long game. And the annual sustainability report has been uh, produced, which incorporates details that talks about how the renewable energies are being incorporated in addition with how the water efficiency in terms of recycling, in terms of water treatments, and in the reduction of portable water, the drinkable water that can be used for the coolant of the uh, data centers. The type of construction that needs to be incorporated to ensure that low carbon emission is uh, uh, ensured, and also the compute power, and even the devices that has been you know, like manufactured as part of Amazon as a brand, we are trying to look into the low power mode with recycled materials. We are looking for partnering with you to understand what is the type of use cases that you might have. Uh, I do understand that this is on a very high level introductory um, uh, interaction for the sustainability goals and what we are doing in this journey. But we would like to join hands with you to understand what is the type of workload that you have? What is the type of business objectives uh, which you are going through? If you are a partner, what is your end customer who is trying to achieve? Are they thinking about the sustainability use cases or would you be able to help them in terms of understanding what those use cases looks like? And also in terms of optimizing the workloads that it can be efficient when they run on the cloud. Now let's talk about the core engine, the architecture. When we talk about the architecture, we got to think about the application continuum. And as you can see towards the left is where you got the apps that can be easily hosted on any cloud, right? Things like your web applications, your enterprise applications. It could be your single tier, two tier, or a three tier app that is hosted on your existing data center. And on the right to the contractory is those applications that are hosted in the on-premises and they might have some business case where they need to be on-premises. So when I say on-premises, it needs to be close to the uh, location where the actual compute and analysis is being handled. In the middle, we got the um, applications, which could go either way. It purely depends on the return of investment, which your customer is going to go through. So today's session, I'm going to focus predominantly on the second and the third box on how we would be able to have the hybrid cloud. What are the different use cases that is going to be associated with that? The challenges which uh, I have seen the customers and uh, as a group, what we have seen the customers have gone through and how we would be able to provide the options for the customer to be both self-centric and thinking about the future, but still able to handle the government and the contractual obligations that they might have and the ability to parse local data and uh, to satisfy the low latency obliga obligations which they will be having with the applications part. Now let's dive a bit deeper into the use cases. On a high level, where we have seen most of the hybrid cloud suitability comes into picture is whenever you got an application that is uh, latency sensitive, you might have different workloads that are complex. It might have a variety of host and storage systems, um, or it might have applications which is really sensitive to the latency. For example, if I am playing a video game or if you are uh, getting into a uh, AR or a VR kind of, you know, like a model, you need that interactive workload to be uh, quick enough to respond so that the user experience is not spoiled. Or it could be that you have a hybrid workflow, you want to have, you know, all your alerting in place that the computation logic is applicable and the local data processing takes a very limited time for it to progress further. Or it can 
it, it doesn't necessarily need to be a technology issue. It could be something like a contractual issue, which you might have. It might be that uh, that might be a mandate that it needs to be, uh, the data needs to be retained within a specific country or a specific region, or even within a specific parameter. Think about public sector. Government regulations have a lot of such kind of criteria to enforce that the data must be within a particular perimeter. Uh, and the InfoSec and other compliance uh, requirements might also drive those uh, necessities. All right, so now we understand, you know, like what those use cases look like. But what might be the challenges of these, you know, like a hybrid cloud? I would like you to, you know, like visualize it from uh, three different layers. One from a core IT layer, two from an application development layer, and three from an executive layer. If I think about from a, a IT layer, if you are going getting into a hybrid cloud, you are essentially given with multiple environments for you to manage your operating systems, your uh, model of uh, engagement, um, your um, uh, SLAs, all needs to be defined differently for your different environments. From an application development perspective, you need similar principles or same principles for your design, for your application code, and also the quality management. And from an executive point of view, if you think about from a hybrid cloud, you need to have different vendors, you need to have different partners, you need to have different skill sets. And it inbuilds, you know, at times uh, drives towards uh, the uh, technical depth towards the applications that you have, which could slow down the products that you might have in line for release. And it may not actually help in terms of uh, releasing your products uh, sooner enough that you are competitive enough in the market. So customers want the same experience across on-premises and the cloud. So whenever we think about hybrid cloud, it needs to be reliable. It needs to have the same level of consistency. It should have uh, same development practices, and it should help the execs go ahead and position their product in the market pretty faster. And whenever we think about the hybrid cloud options, AWS has multiple uh, components that could help fit uh, depending on the use case that you might go through. I'm not even going to talk about uh, the left side of this uh, equation because we know that if an application can be hosted on the cloud, it is pretty easy and we have discussed in detail on what all the different options are on that. But I really want to concentrate on the middle and towards the right. Let's say you got a regulatory or a compliance workload or a low latency system and you want the applications and the data to be close enough. Or you might have systems where uh, you may not currently have the local cloud presence, but still you got a perimeter and you got, you know, like a different uh, um, mobile network options in terms of gamings, in terms of uh, compliance, and you want to hold that in a, a very specific uh, region that you are able to sort out your business needs. Or you may not have a dedicated uh, geography that is associated with your particular system. Imagine flight travel. You want to have the alerts. You want to have the data that needs to be sent each and every second. And you need to have storage that is appropriately mapped for you to um, help there. So with this, AWS have options um, with the details that we went through. Outpost fits best for applications wherever you want to have hybrid cloud. Local zones and wavelengths are pretty new. We currently have that in the US zone, um, which serves help the metro centers and also the 5G mobile networks. IoT, yes, it is a, you know, like a beast by itself. Um, so today we're gonna focus predominantly on the Outpost and how Outpost would be able to help you in terms of integrating. And remember the challenge that we were forecasting earlier in terms of providing the same level of experience irrespective of where your data and your applications are hosted. Outpost is designed in a very same fashion in the same, you know, like a design principles of how, you know, like a typical uh, AWS components will be designed through. It is fully managed, it is monitored and operated by AWS in all the regions. It's a single pane of management. As far as you've got the AWS console access, all you've got to do is you've got to extend your AWS outpost as part of your, you know, like a console, and you would be able to manage with the same sort of APIs and the tools in the AWS regions. And uh, as it is getting populated, you could see different types of applications can be hosted on uh, Outpost, uh, which starts from, you know, like enterprise applications to a latest, you know, uh, alerting or a messaging system, which requires a low latency. 
And from what we have seen on the field, different sectors of customers use it and a few predominantly, you know, like uh, um, standout or media and entertainment, the health sector and also the public sector. Uh, even you would be able to use Outpost for the banking transactions. You might have a payment gateway, which requires low latency and um, you might have, you know, like a high compliance over internet where you need to store the data within that particular um, area of your, you know, like uh, agreement. How does it look like? So let's say we discussed about, you know, like what the use cases are and uh, where we would be able to uh, position Outpost for you to go ahead and use it. This is a standard, you know, like 42U rack. And the Outpost racks are fully assembled and it is either installed directly by AWS or the trusted partners. We got centralized redundancy that is applicable and the active components include the top of rack switches. It is currently supported in 60 uh, countries and territories. As of 2020, it was only 52. And in 2021, we added eight more uh, uh, countries and territories. And with all those, outposts are being currently supported. And as you can see, it is currently integrated with all the 23 regions. And for all those that has been announced, there are plans in place where we will be integrating AWS Outpost directly whenever the region is being released. So if you are a customer uh, that is falling under uh, any of these uh, map zones, then you would be able to interact and connect to your uh, local region. If the region doesn't exist uh, in that particular uh, um, uh, uh, country, then uh, whatever is the closest, you would be able to connect that and you should be able to work as if it is in the, you know, like a local storage area. How AWS Outpost predominantly, you know, like address the customer challenges. First thing, we were talking about the three uh, different segments, right? From an IT point of view, it is a consolidated overview you are going to have same level of service. You're going to have same level of APIs. You're going to have the same level of efficiency that is defined because your SLAs, your mode of um, um, uh, development, the design principles that you're going to apply for the outpost is the same as if you're going to design on the AWS cloud. From an application design point of view, if you're going to develop a CI/CD framework, if you're going to develop an architecture principle, you don't have to bend or you don't have to, you know, like leave any of the legacy uh, in the outpost. You could go ahead and uh, do whatever that you can do on the cloud on the uh, outpost too. From an executive point of view, you are meeting all your residency requirements, you're meeting all your regulatory requirements, and your team is efficient now because it is one single pane of glass which they're going to look into and all the development is going to happen irrespective of where the actual application is going to be hosted. From a services point of view, Outpost can hold, um, other than the uh, regular services like EC2, ABS, and RDS, um, think about uh, a complete uh, disaster recovery setup using Cloud Endure. Or you want to run a machine learning algorithm, or you want to have a containerized or a Kubernetes model of uh, execution you can still go ahead and use Outpost and run all the latest services that you might be able to run on AWS directly. Let's now talk about, you know, like uh, how hard or how easy it is to connect um, uh, Outpost to your existing VPC. You might have a use case where um, you want to connect to your AWS Outpost that is hosted on your customer on-premises in a private mode. If that is the case, in the AWS region, you will have to create the service link endpoints and you will have to create private WIVs that is associated with your VPC. Direct Connect enables you to have that private link set up between uh, the AWS region and the customer on-premises. If in case your customer doesn't have a Direct Connect, then you can also go ahead with private VPN connectivity. And in case of public access, just replace the private connectivity with uh, public WIF and uh, public Amazon uh, Elastic IPs. And you should be able to access that both using your public internet or if you want to have a subset that is defined for public and private, you should still be able to go ahead and integrate that. You would be able to easily extend your VPC by integrating Outpost as part of your subnets. So, and this is where the single pane view of glass comes into picture. From a developer point of view, from a sysadmin point of view, or system integrator point of view, all I'm dealing with is one system, one VPC where I have different subnets. And within each subnet, I might have different compute, different database, different storage, and AWS Outpost can be part of that as one subnet. 
And all you got to do is you got to use the interface endpoints, which is the uh, private links that can integrate you to the global services like Amazon S3 or DynamoDB. Right, let's talk about the most important part. How about the security? There is built-in tamper protection and everything that you're gonna host within the uh, outpost is encrypted. Um, the hardware security key is uh, specific to each server and uh, the uh, encryption uh, network, it depends on you know like what you're gonna use. If it is gonna be a private VPN, then you got the certificates, you got the TLS connections, or if it is gonna be a uh, direct connect, then you have uh, data uh, can, that can be encrypted at uh, rest and also transit. However, the physical security of the outpost location is the customer's responsibility. And this is where the shared responsibility model differs a bit uh, when you think about a typical EC2 instance that is part of an uh, AWS account versus outpost that is hosted within the on-premises world. It's great, let's say Outpost uh, helps me in terms of uh, um, setting it up, low latency. Uh, I'm able to, you know, like uh, have uh, the compliance and the um, uh, the rewards that is associated with uh, having it as part of the perimeter. But how about the uh, scalability? So with Outpost, you can uh, both scale out and also scale up. Uh, with scale out, it is uh, pretty uh, simple and straightforward where you can add more racks to it. With scale up, you can go ahead uh, with three different, you know, like uh, typical servers currently configurations. It can be small, medium, or large. If you are a small, you can go for a medium or large and vice versa from medium to large. And um, uh, the, the only catch behind that is uh, about, you know, like uh, having that commitment uh, between, you know, like the upgrades. If you're going to go for an upgrade, then you will be signing up for the, you know, like uh, uh, the duration of the usage and the clock will start from there. Uh, it depends on the enterprise agreement too. If you are, you know, like a strategic customer, if you got, you know, like a plans that is associated with that, then please reach us out and we will be able to help you in terms of the overall commitments. All right, how hard it is to get outpost? Nope, it is simple three steps. You order, once the order has been accepted, the AWS teams come and they would be able to help you install and they will be launching and you would be able to launch from there on uh, with the AWS resources locally. And one of the uh, references which I want to, you know, like uh, put it to side. The challenge which Morningstar uh, as a customer face is to have the multi-year cloud journey. And this is something, you know, like uh, which we resonate with other enterprise customers too. It is very easy for the enterprise customers to get into analysis paralysis, which doesn't let them to move on to the AWS world or even to the any cloud world uh, that easily. If you really have to eliminate that level of you know, uh, analysis paralysis, probably the first step is to have AWS outposts that can be run on-premises, where you would still be able to host your applications irrespective of the type of uh, architecture that you're gonna put through. It supports containerization, it supports um, uh, Kubernetes. You would be able to have EMRs that can be run uh, to help support the workloads. So it predominantly helps in terms of building the confidence it helps in terms of seamlessly migrating to an AWS region as a second step. We do have, you know, like other use cases. If you are specific about any particular uh, industry or vertical, please reach us out. Uh, we should be able to help you with uh, that particular use case. All right, let's look into the most important part, the business transformation. The typical business transformation falls into either of these two approaches. One, the enterprise is ready to migrate. They have done their analysis. They want to move. However, they are very focused on the cost. They want to do the migration first and then start thinking about what the innovation as the second step. Or it could be the second one where the customer understands that they got a lot of legacy application. They do understand that they have a lot of technical depth. So they leave a majority of their portion that is currently running on the on-premises and then try to go ahead and innovate only on the smaller portions of their applications. None of this approach is bad, but the challenge which this approach has is that it doesn't connect itself in terms of its IT goals to the business goals. Yes, you are moving it from a virtual machine to an EC2 instance. Yes, you have moved away from your typical load balancer to to an application load balancer, or let's keep the other way. Yes, you have migrated your single tier application into a completely serverless application, or you hosted on, you know, like Outpost and moved on to the on-premises world uh, with the capability to um, hold and have the integration with AWS APIs. But 
what is the impact that you have brought on the business layer? And this is where we want to, you know, like bring in the thought process and we would like to partner with you uh, to help and enable those business goals. Typically, if you think about it, your traditional IT goals may or may not actually map to your business goals. But if you think about it on the other way, if you have a business goal, it will definitely impact your architecture and your traditional infrastructure layers. So we would like to partner with you. And we have done this with a few of the customers uh, in terms of defining the insights, uh, in terms of the uh, layers of innovations, the product lines, the new geography that you might be able to achieve, and the modernization pathway that your actual business outcome is achieved. It could be more revenue generation. It could be more uh, branding name. Or it could be that you want to have a new set of uh, additional customers from a different region or even within the same region, but reaching out to a new layer of customers. When we initially talked about the drivers, we were talking about the different segments of customers in terms of age, in terms of geo, in terms of usage. So you might have to define your business outcomes to cater all these layers that your business is sustainable and you are able to achieve your transformation goals for the future. We have partnered with uh, uh, customers on the field and few of the mature customers have been, you know, like quieted here who have um, achieved the cost savings, their ability to innovate, the data growth, um, the machine learning algorithms and their ability to relocate quickly onto the AWS world. These are few examples and we have, you know, like uh, different samples and we would like to, again, as I say, if you got um, uh, any questions on any of these three layers of transformation, or if you are in a journey where you have queries that could help you in terms of acceleration, please reach us out. And I believe this session is um, uh, helpful to you and uh, looking forward to help you in the future sessions too.